Mr. Cochran, <coughs> you've painted a, to my colleagues a very uh, good picture of the, the, the state of the company at the moment. But in May of this year, J.P. Morgan's report said it had poor financial performance. You've been the finance director, finance officer for uh, since 2021. Weak operational performance, a stretched balance sheet. Uh, it talked about the enforcement cases coming from Offwat and uh, uh, portended stricter Offwat dividend policy coming in the future. Um, 151 of your staff you've now chosen to make redundant. That was on the 20th of June, just a month after that report. Are they paying the price for your failure? I think we have been very clear, uh, indeed on, on Monday when we released our results, that our operational and financial performance wasn't where it needed to be. Uh, we've been very transparent about that. We know we need to improve performance for our customers. You haven't been transparent about that for the past two years, have you, since you've been financial director? Let, let's look at the, the figure that you discussed with my colleague earlier, £14 billion pounds of debt. Um, I think actually note 18 of your account shows that your borrowings are £15.7 billion. How does that reconcile with the £14 billion that you were talking about earlier? So £14 billion, just to be absolutely clear, is our statutory measure of net debt. Net debt. Um, it, for covenant calculation purposes, which is what we report in terms of gearing, it's 14.7 billion. And that takes account of um, what is called debt accretion, the additional costs for hedging, inflation, and other risks. Um, oh, that was 14.5, isn't it? 14.7. I thought 14.5 takes the form of your whole business securitization, a structure that you've used. Uh, to borrow against your highly regulated assets? So a net debt on a covenant basis is 14.7. Um, that, as I say, compares so to get to the 77% of gearing, which is the lowest level of gearing in the, lo in the last decade that we announced this week. <laughs> Sorry, the lowest level of gearing in the last decade that you've announced, but the second highest in the sector. Indeed. But yeah, yeah, indeed. And the off what when you were regulating off what or controlling off what Ms. Ross, um, I thought you said that the, the uh, ratio should be 60 per cent, <coughs> not 77, not 80. Is that not the case? You said it should be 60 per cent? Well, the 60 per cent gearing that we were using when I was at Offwatt, and in fact Offwatt's been using um, right up until the last price review, is the notional level of gearing that Offwatt uses to input into the formula that it uses to determine the weighted average cost of capital. So did you recommend 60 per cent? Yes, you did, didn't you? No, we were using a 60 per cent assumption for the purposes of calculating the weighted average cost of capital in a price control. So you weren't concerned at all that at that period the company had over 80 per cent? Our view at the time, and I, I, I will fully acknowledge that views have moved on, but our view at the time was that a company's choice of capital structure was a matter for the company itself and that the shareholders bore the risk of that. Now obviously views have moved on since then, <coughs> that was the view at the time. Right. So now that the views have moved on, what discussions have you had with the government on the potential nationalisation of your company? None. None. Why do you think it's being talked about in the press so freely? Well, I can say that over the last couple of weeks I've read a lot uh, in the press. Uh, some of that was rather more uh, outlandish uh, than perhaps uh, we would have liked. I think well, one of the things that may be outlandish, maybe Mr Cochran can come to this, is the way in which you structured, uh, what was it, £560 million pounds of debt just in the case that the government should have to take over the company. Do you want to comment on that, Mr Cochran? Which debt are you referring to? Uh, this is the, the amount of money that would be payable from your debt uh, should the government, the government would have to pay £560 million pounds off to your, your, share, your debtors? Um, I, I, I don't recognise that figure. But, um, don't. I think what Barry is referring to is, is when um, Mr Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party and there were manifesto commitments to... I think I'll say it in my own words, Chair. Thank okay, you Barry. very much. Okay. 
Um, there was uh, talk about the nationalisation of the water company at that time, um, but actually since then it, public opinion's moved on. Public opinion has actually gone from 79% of people opposed to, to nationalisation now to 83 because of the way in which your companies have been failing um, to, to meet the public's expectations. Um, so nationalisation uh, seems to be a pretty popular thing amongst the public, uh, and maybe that's referenced in the press. Um, but my question is about uh, the way in which you included a clause in a previous debt issue that would require the government to immediately pay off around half a billion pounds of debt in the case of nationalisation. You don't recognise that clause? Don't recognise that clause, no. Okay, in that case, perhaps you could... Sorry, Sir Adrian, you, you seem to want to come in there. I was going to address the question of nationalisation very well, briefly. Okay, if, if we can just finish, finish off with Mr Cochrane first. Um, if you could write to us, to tell us, in fact, was such a clause included in a previous debt issue? If it was, why was it? And what would the implications of that have been for the, uh, for the government? Thank you very much. We'll do that. Yes, Sir Adrian. Um, I was going to address your question on nationalisation. If, if you go back the very dawn of the private ownership of these utilities, the rationale was to empower the utilities to borrow privately, to use private sector capabilities to generate <coughs> performance through the uh, uh, operation of the utilities. We say that we have much more to do in that area. But I think the key thing is remove from the Treasury the burden of funding the improvements to the water sector that we are now managing privately. And uh, that was the driver of privatisation. But the, the problem, Sir Adrian, has been that actually, the, although there has been substantial investment in the infrastructure uh, since privatisation, I absolutely agree with you on that, it hasn't been enough, has it? And that's exactly the point of my colleague Mr Dunn's questions to, to your colleague earlier. And indeed, we've got to increase the flow of that investment. That's what our refinancing package is aiming to do. But what your structure, the structure of the company, not when you were there, Sir Adrian, but what the structure of the company allowed was for an Australian bank to actually leverage uh, the fact that your regulated asset to extract money out. Course, did yeah. not. Yes, I think that there was yes. a flow of dividends mm -hmm. from the company under previous ownership. It, it's for us quite a long time ago, Mr Gardner. I think it reflected slightly... It reflects the state of the company now, doesn't it, Sir Adrian? It reflects, I think, the state of what the markets were and the practices at that time. Um, I, can't, I can't... Those practices can't, are still going on, aren't they? I can't... Quarry's correct. doing the same in other regulated industries. And actually, you yourself, I believe, uh, are on one of Macquarie's companies, Cadent, and, and, and actually Catherine Ross um, is on British Grass Transmission, aren't you? National Gas Transmission. Na National Gas Transmission, which are both Macquarie companies. No, so not... it seems that there, there's a very cosy arrangement here. <coughs> I have to correct you, Mr Gardner. They are not Macquarie companies. They have a range of international investors in them, including, in my case, Chinese and Qatari investors. Um, they're all very responsible investors. They're all seeking to improve the performance of the companies. That is the case here. It was probably the case when Macquarie owned a major stake in the company. I can't answer to that myself. But this was ancient history, relatively speaking, ancient history for us, because Macquarie exited in 2017. Well, you and I have a different definition of ancient, Sir Adrian. Thank you very much. Reflects my <laughs> age. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Robert. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Catherine Ross, in 2014, as the Chief Executive of the Water Regulator, you signed off the business plans for the water companies, didn't you? I did. And you just said that at that time you thought it was OK for those companies to increase their debts because it was their risk. Is that right? Yep. What would have happened at that time if any of the water companies went bankrupt? Oh, gosh. Right. So just, let's just take a step back. Um, and if you could ask my question, if a company during the time when you were CEO went bust... What would have happened? Yeah. So what would have happened in the event of, of a bankruptcy or insolvency is that the special administration regime that's set out in the legislative framework would, would kick in. 
that is a decision for the Secretary of State. I mean, when I was at Ofwat, our expectation would have been that we would advise on that, uh, but it would, would have been a decision, as I think it still is, for the Secretary of State. In plain English, that means that it would have had to be nationalised and taxpayers would have had to pick up the bill. That's right, isn't it? Uh, not necessarily. Well, no. A special, special administrative regime, either you sell the business to someone else as a going concern, as we've seen in the failure of the energy market, or the government has to pick up the bill, as it had to do with bulb energy. So ultimately, the taxpayer would have been on the hook, wouldn't they? Well, in the event that the company uh, couldn't be sold as a going concern, uh, yes, there would be some liabilities that would have to be met, and they could be met by the taxpayer, or they could be passed on to future customers, depending on the regulatory regime at the time. Right. We're here today because Thames Water, which you now run, is in a position where the government is having to plan to renationalise you because of a failure of your finances. But you signed off as the chief executive of the regulator in 2014 for Macquarie to ramp up the debt from £3 billion to £10 billion whilst taking out nearly £3 billion in dividends, often paying dividends higher than the profits the company made in particular years. The reason we're in this position and the reason that taxpayers are now potentially on the hook for billions and billions of pounds of national borrowing is because you as the chief executive of the regulator and the regulator failed in delivering your statutory duties. Do you want to apologise to the public, Ms Ross? Well, I don't accept that characterisation of off what's price control in, in 2014. The other thing I would say as well is special administration is obviously uh, a matter for the government, but special administration is very much a nuclear option. There is a very, very high bar uh, on the government deciding to put a company into special administration. And one of those uh, triggers would be insolvency, and the other one would be, uh, you know, perhaps a persistent and severe breach of our licence. Uh, now, we are not close to either of those two triggers, and you heard uh, our CFO uh, talking a little while ago about the fact, about the fact that we have £4.4 .4 billion of liquidity. We are a long way off uh, that insolvency trigger, and I think a long way off the conditions for special administration being met. Okay. Could, I, could I just add something? Because, yeah. When I'm ready, sorry, Jim, sorry, forgive me. Um, so, Ms Ross, you just said in the 2014 price review you didn't accept that characterisation, but you've just admitted to the committee that you signed off the business plans that allowed Macquarie to increase the debt, which has got Thames Water into the position it's, it's been in. The regulator facilitated this problem, didn't it? Let me, let me clarify. So, in 2014, uh, the Offwatt board, not just the Offwatt chief executive, uh, issues, issued a set of final determinations. That, that, that is correct. What those final determinations actually did was set out what the company needed to deliver for its customers and the environment, and also the amount of money that they could recover from their customers to do that. That is all they did. And then, of course, the incentive uh, framework that Offwatt puts around that determines the amount of money that the company actually makes. Now, Offwatt policy at that time, which has moved on, but Offwatt policy at that time was that if a company made a profit under that regu regulatory regime, it was up to the company to decide what it did with that. So if it chose to pay that profit out of the company uh, in distributions, uh, it was free to do that. Um, uh, Ms Ross, uh, let me ask the question in a different way. Uh, two of the statutory obligations of Ofwat, the regu regu water regulator when it was set up, was one, to protect the interests of customers, and two, to make sure the privatised water companies could finance themselves. On both of those measures, are you seriously telling the committee today that you as the Chief Executive of the Regulator at the time succeeded in delivering those statutory obligations in the context that you're before the committee today? Are you really saying that was a, su a success? I think at the time when I was at Offwatt, and I believe it to be true today, everybody at Offwatt takes their statutory duties incredibly seriously. What did you perform them? We were exercising our functions in pursuit of our statutory duties. Whether every decision we made was perfect with the benefit of hindsight, <coughs> possibly not. But that's exactly what we were trying to with, do. With the benefit of hindsight, would you like to apologise to the taxpayer for being here and put, potentially putting them in this position where, yet again, another regulated market could potentially collapse and expose taxpayers to billions of pounds? I think if you're asking for an apology from Offwort, I think you should... Asking for an apology from you, Ms Ross? No, I, w I, w I won't apologise for my role as chief apologize. executive as, as, as Offwort, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. I think Barry wanted to come in with another yes, quick point. Yes, just on the, the question that my colleagues just raised. Um, if you go through special administration, then, of course, the shareholders take the hit if the company isn't financially viable. And that's, that's what shareholders are for. And that, of course, relates to the 560 million question earlier. Um, but the process need not be renationalisation as such. You could actually set up regional local authority bodies to take over and transfer the company as a going concern 
to those regional local authorities, could you not? I think that would be possible, yes. And, and, and actually, that is the way in which many countries in the rest of the world actually run their water industry, isn't it? I mean, there is, as I said before, there is, there is a perfectly reasonable debate to be had about the right structure and ownership uh, uh, the, model. The, the question sector. was simple. It was, that is the way that many other countries in the world run their water industry, is it not? Yes, there are a variety of models, and that's one of them. And, and, and they do it, actually, more successfully in many cases than we happen to have done, don't they? Can't comment on that. Well, in, in terms of the, the questions that my colleague Philip Dunn put to you earlier... Um, I haven't got the comparative information about the performance of different regimes. Finished. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just a couple of final...